Okay, um, the Apostle Paul. This chart talks about the uh, chronological order in which he wrote his letters. You will notice that uh, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, which we'll deal with next week, were the last of his letters. Um, the, where we are today, we're dealing with 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, which are, depending upon who you talk to, were either his second and third letters, or some people believe 1st Thessalonians might have actually been his first letter. If the people who hold to the northern Galatian theory, who believe that the, Paul was writing to churches in the northern, the, the historic location of Asia Minor that was called Galatia, then they believe that that happened later, which means 1 Thessalonians would have been his first letter. The, the more common belief, and what I believe, is that he was actually writing back to the churches that he had planted when he and Barnabas went on the first missionary journey. The churches in Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and uh, Antioch of Pisidia. And those are the Galatian churches because the Romans had, had redrawn the lines, and that was part of the Roman province of Galatia. But, so I believe that Galatians, along with the person who did this chart, that Galatians was the first book, and then the books we're looking at today, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, were the second and third book that he wrote. This chart, again, I keep saying this, is available online to you so that you can access that, and uh, I think it's very valuable. It tells you who he was writing to, when, it, as best we know, they were writing, and what the theme was, all right? This map, Paul was born in Tarsus, uh, grew up and was trained in Jerusalem, had a, a miraculous experience of Jesus on the road to Damascus when he was going there to arrest Jewish Christians. Um, he spent most of his adult life with Antioch as his base of operations. He and Barnabas were involved with the church in Antioch. Apparently, and we had this question raised before, Paul and Barnabas didn't plant the church. Apparently, Peter planted the church. But Paul and Barnabas went there when it was still very young, and they uh, worked with that church. So every time that Paul would go on one of his missionary journeys and he would return, he would go back to Antioch. That became his base of operations, his home, even though Tarsus was his hometown. We've talked about Colossians to the church in Colossae, Ephesians to the church in Ephesus, Philippians to the church in Philippi, Corinth was where he wrote the church to the Corinthians, and today we're going to talk about Thessalonica, and you will see where it's located up here. Uh, this is in the area known as Macedonia. Uh, today it is part of Greece. Uh, we've also talked about Romans, of course. Thessalonica was uh, an important city. In Paul's day, um, it was one of the most important cities in the Greek Empire. Today it's the second biggest city in Greece after Athens. Back in those days, Corinth was the biggest city, and that's why Paul spent time in Corinth. But Thessalonica, which today is called Thessaloniki, the name has changed slightly, but it still has the same basic name, but Thessalonica in the old days was a major uh, port, and it was also a major training center because, as we've talked about before, uh, right here where this little line is connecting Europe and Asia, this was the city of Byzantium, which had become Constantinople, it became Constantinople in the 4th century after Paul, but this was a major center, a major crossroads in between Europe and Asia. There was a major road, a Roman road, called the Ignatian Way, which was the interstate highway between the east and the western part of the Roman empires. It started in Rome, and it traversed from Rome all the way up and then across Eastern Europe, and it actually swung down because the Thessalonica and Philippi were on the Ignatian Way. If you go to Philippi today, I've not been to Thessalonica, but if you go to Philippi today, there are stones which are carved that are still there 2,000 years later that say Ignatian Way. And so this major Roman road, traffic, com commercial traffic, private travelers, everybody took this road. It was the way to get from the east to the west or the west to the east. Well, Thessalonica was on that road, and as you can see, it was a major port, so it was a hugely important city, as was Corinth down here. Same sort of thing. Now, both of these were, were, confirmed the fact that Paul was an urban missionary, right? Paul was not a, a country preacher. Paul's ministry regularly, consistently, was to major cities where there were large populations of people, both Jewish people and Jewish synagogues but also large populations of Gentile people. And a question was asked earlier, one of the, one of the notes on the uh, what you need to know from Pauline epistles is, why was Paul called the apostle to the Gentiles? 
Well, Paul, of course, was a Jew, and the, the, he always, everywhere he went, Paul would start out by going to the local synagogue and preaching to the local Jews and explaining to them, which was, he could do because he was trained in the Jewish law, he would explain to them how it is that all of the promise that God had made to the Jewish people down through history, that he would, he would eventually send a Messiah who would be in the line of David to save them you know, from their sins, to reestablish the greatness of Israel, Paul would present to the Jews the message that Jesus was that Messiah that God had been promising for so long. And in almost every case, he would have Jewish converts. The Jews that did not come convert to Christian belief would usually then become active opponents of that. Um, but after he preached in the synagogue, Paul always then would go and preach in public squares and other areas where Gentiles would be gathered. <coughs> he saw himself, and he felt called, actually he believed this commissioning was from God, to be the, um, the apostle to the Gentiles because of the fact that he planted churches all over this area, which while there were Jews living in those areas, they were predominantly Gentile. And then over into Europe, what we know of as Greece, Macedonia. Um, those were predominantly Gentile populations, and Paul felt the special call to go to those people. And then he also preached to the Jews along the way. Whereas Peter's ministry, even though Peter was the one who converted the first Gentiles, Cornelius the Roman centurion and his family, in Caesarea with the first converts, Gentile converts to Christianity. So there wasn't any hard and fast line there, but generally speaking, uh, Paul himself identifies that Peter was the apostle to the Jews, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, but they crossed over, all right? Um, Thessalonica was a predominantly Gentile city, but there was a Jewish population and a Jewish synagogue there. We've got seats up front, too, if anybody wants to sit up front. You know, whatever's good for you. So, Paul, as I say, was an urban missionary. He went to cities like Corinth and Athens, Thessalonica, Ephesus, some of the major cities of the day. In fact, Antioch, where he set up his base of operations, and where the first predominantly Gentile church was established, was the third biggest city in the whole Roman Empire. One was Rome, two was Alexandria in Egypt, three was Antioch of Syria, okay, the Antioch over here was Antioch of Pisidia, that, to differentiate those two. So the third biggest city in the Roman Empire was Paul's base of operations. And he then spent time in cities like Corinth and Ephesus, which would have, which would have been in the top ten in terms of significant cities in the Roman Empire. Paul was an urban missionary. And we need to remember that about him. And why? Because that's where he could reach the most people. The definition of a city is where a lot of people get together and live. And so that's, that's what Paul was doing. This chart as well, you can see this holds as I do to Galatians being the first of the letters, and then 1st and 2nd Thessalonians being the second of the letters sometime around AD 50, <coughs> all right? Um, this was Paul's second missionary journey. It was the, the journey in which he planted the church in Thessalonica. Paul left Antioch after he and Barnabas had a falling out. He and Barnabas had been good friends, both of them working with the church in Antioch. But on their first missionary journey, Barnabas took along his cousin, John Mark, who is the writer of the Gospel of Mark. John Mark was a young man, and he traveled with them as far as they, you know, they left Antioch by boat, went to Cyprus, and then over to uh, Italia, well, Anatolia today. And at that point, Mark, John Mark deserts them and goes back to Jerusalem. And Paul was very upset with him. When they started to get ready for their second missionary journey, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark along with him on the second trip, and Paul said, absolutely not. He deserted us on the first trip. Why would we take him again? Well, they had a falling out over that. And um, from Antioch, Barnabas took John Mark to Cyprus on a mission trip. We don't know where they went from that, but we do know they headed to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas who sometimes, depending upon which translation you read, it'll be identified as Silvanus. Silvanus is the, the Greek version of that name. So Silvanus and Silas are the same person. They headed overland through Silesia to revisit the churches in Derby, Lystra, and Iconium. Along the way, they picked up a young man named Timothy, who also became, obviously, Paul was very close to Timothy. He was like a son to him, a disciple of Paul's, and he ended up writing two of his New Testament letters to him. 
But then they crossed over and they ended up in Troas, which is near the ancient city of Troy. It's right on the Aegean Sea. In Troas, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia in his vision. See Macedonia. This is all considered Macedonia. Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come over and help us. So Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and at this point Luke picks up with them, they get on a boat and they cross over. They spend one night in Samothrace, which is an island, and then they cross over, they land at Neapolis, and then go from Neapolis, which is the port, to the town of Philippi, which is not far from Neapolis. They spend some time in Philippi, and Paul plants a church there, the first convert in Europe is a woman named Lydia, who was a dealer in purple cloth, which probably meant she was very well-to-do, because only wealthy, in fact, only royalty, only people who were related to the emperor were allowed to wear purple. It was the royal color. So she was a dealer in purple cloth from Thyatira. Thyatira is here. So she was actually from Asia. She was from Asia Minor. But she was living in Philippi. All of Lydia and her household convert to Christianity. She is baptized, and then it's actually a funny little passage. It says that um, Lydia invites them to come home with them, and they said, well, no, they couldn't. And then it says, but she persuaded us. The, the actual Greek says, but she forced us. <laughs> she would not take no for an answer. She forced them to go home and stay with her. So from Philippi, they then visit Amphipolis, uh, Apollonia and then to the town of Thessalonica, which again was a major city back then, right on the Ignatian Way, a port and a land trade center. And Paul first goes to the synagogue and he preaches, and it says that uh, some Jews are converted, some don't like him. It then says that some of the wealthy women who were Gentile women in the community believed Paul and were converted. Now, the Jews in that day <clears throat> Um, were always attracting Gentiles who were interested in monotheism. In those days, there was if you if you started thinking, I don't think that there are all these gods. Nobody really. By this time, the pantheon of Greek and Roman gods had worn very thin. There was no sense of salvation. There was no sense of having a relationship with the with these gods. For the most part, it amounted to you know you have to do something to show. Um, Worship of these gods are the my virtue, because the Greek gods loved to do things to people and just, just to watch them dance. You know, they would get, do terrible things to them just to see what would happen, and they thought it was funny. Well, there was no sense in which you wanted to be related to these gods. There was no upside. And so, by the first century, the whole idea of these pagan gods was wearing very thin with people. And so a lot of Gentiles looked around and said, you know, I believe there must be some divine power, but I don't believe in all these multiple gods. Maybe there's just one god. Well, there was only one place to go if you wanted to, to find out about one God, a monotheism. That was Judaism. And so Gentiles would typically, if they were interested in those things and wanted to find out more, they would go and listen in at the synagogue. You know, when they, would, when they were preaching, giving meditations, reading of the, uh, the Hebrew scripture, they could not come into the synagogue sanctuary, but they could stand outside and listen out the windows. And it was very common for Gentiles to do that. And in this case, after Paul preached to the Jews, he then started preaching to the Gentiles. And we're told in Acts, Acts 17 is the story of his visit to Thessalonica, that some of the wealthy Gentile women started believing him and started uh, following Paul and his gospel. It appears from the way it's written that that ticked the Jews off because they probably got great benefit from these wealthy women who were Gentiles, just paying attention to the, the, their teaching. And Paul was taking part of, their, you know, part of their resources, part of their flock, whatever. So they got upset at him in Thessalonica. They apparently went down to the local market and got a bunch of thugs, rough men, to come and get after Paul and the members of the church that had converted. They had already started meeting as a church. And so Paul, for the... For the sake of the church, not because he himself was frightened so much, but for the sake of the church to try to diminish the oppression that they were feeling, he leaves. Now he leaves uh, Timothy and um, Silas behind. And there's an indication that Timothy may have gone back to Philippi as well. But with Paul, seen as the ringleader, when he leaves, the pressure drops. He actually leaves there. They go um, to Berea. He visits Berea for a while. But when he's in the town of Berea, 
which it says they were they were very open to the truth of, of the scripture. Berea is uh, the church in Berea, or the people who are hearing in Berea, are seen as very enlightened and very open-minded about the good things of the gospel, which is why the college I went to was called Berea College, okay, in Kentucky. Um, but from Berea, these, these thugs from Thessalonica, they heard he had gone to Berea and was preaching, and they go all the way down there after him, which is like 60 miles on foot. They go to Berea and start hassling him there. And he has to do something, and so at that point, they get him away at night. He gets on a boat, and he travels by boat down to Athens, from Athens to Corinth. Now, he left Silas and Timothy up in, in the, the churches in Macedonia, and later on, they, they catch up with him in Corinth. At first, he thought he, they might catch up with him in Athens. They catch up with him in Corinth. They tell him how it's going, because he's worried about the church in Thessalonica. He had not been there very long, a few months perhaps. He had planted this church, and then the church had come under persecution, and he was forced to leave for the sake of the church to try to, to lower the threat to them. And so they catch up with them in Corinth, and they, they give him the report that they're doing really well. The church in Thessalonica, they're still being persecuted, but they're holding up. They're keeping true to what you taught them. They love you. They look forward to seeing you again. And so Paul was very concerned because he felt like I planted this church, and then I deserted them. But he gets a very positive report. But along with the positive report, he finds out that some questions have been raised. In particular, the first question that he addresses in the, the, the first letter to the Thessalonians is, well, if somebody believed in Jesus and then they die before Jesus came back, do they get eternal life too? If they died before he came back, are they just gone? Or what's going to happen to them? The people were worried about that. Uh, you know, they had no nobody to teach them, no training after Paul left, although he did send Timothy and Silas back. Um, and so Paul is concerned to address that issue as well as to encourage them in the persecution and to address a couple of other minor issues. It is not like his letter to the Corinthian churches, his letters to the Corinthian church, which they were messing up right and left. I mean, they had sexual immorality, they were suing each other, there was... Uh, Disputes going on between them and discord and disunity. They were listening to false teachers. They were accusing Paul of not really being an apostle. Uh, the church in Corinth was having all kinds of problems. It appears as though while they had some questions that they were troubled about, they were not experiencing the same kinds of problems that some of the other churches, like Corinth and Colossae and others, were having. Okay, um, so Paul writes the letter, the first, the first letter to the Thessalonians. Apparently, he then gets, one of the other guys shows up and says, well, you know, they've got, a, they've got another question related to the second coming of Jesus. All, all of First and Second Thessalonians, even though he talks about other things, at the end of every chapter in First Thessalonians, he makes some, some mention of the return of Jesus. So we know that was a major theme that they were dealing with at that time. The second letter had to do with... Um, after thinking that maybe people who died before Jesus came back were not going to actually experience eternal life, somebody then had come along and told the church in Thessalonica that uh, the second that the Lord has already come back and you missed it. The day of the Lord has already occurred and you guys were asleep at the switch, but he's already come back. And so they were worried about that one. So the book of Second Thessalonians addresses the issue of whether or not the day of the Lord, the return of Jesus, has happened yet. And Paul, Paul has something which, it, it, it's actually a mystery. We don't know what he's referring to. Uh, we can think it's the Antichrist. But Paul says, no, the Lord has not come back. In fact, you'll know the Lord hasn't come back uh, because the man of lawlessness has not yet come. And he doesn't describe what that means. It suggests that it's something he had taught them about when he was there because it doesn't go into detail. Again, maybe the Antichrist... We're not really sure about it, but go online and if you look up Man of Lawlessness, every cult under the sun has interpreted that one way or another, all right? And, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, and the, you know, they make hay with that Man of Lawlessness thing. The fact is we don't know what he's talking about, what he's referring to. It is, is all, in all likelihood a reference to the Antichrist, but he doesn't go into detail and he seems to be referring to something he talked about earlier, okay? Um, Questions about that general stuff? Are we clear on what this is all about? Mm -hmm. Can I make yes. a, a, a brief comment? Um, 
and the reason the reason I can say this is because I, I just I just happened to finish a big Bible study in First Thessalonians. Okay. It was so so wonderful. What so impressed me is that the stability in the midst of such persecution and resistance that these saints had, and and in Acts 17, Paul was only there three Sabbaths. That's 21 days. But it's, at the time, it was very brief there. And he leaves, but he plants such a solid base that these people embraced the gospel in spite of this tremendous opposition that rose against them. Right. That was very, very impressive. Yeah, and, and you're right. And he's very proud of them. And he says yes, that. Yes. You know, I get great reports of you. I'm very pleased with you and proud of you and with great affection. So uh, he actually visited the church of Thessalonica three times. This was when he planted it in his first trip, first or a second missionary journey rather, the first time he went there. And then in his third missionary journey, he leaves out from Antioch to Ephesus. He crosses over, visits Thessalonica, then goes down to Corinth. And then he's going to head straight back, but he finds out that the boats are full of Jewish people that are headed back for the festivals in, in, in Jerusalem and that they're on the lookout for Paul. And he gets word that if he gets on a boat with all these Jewish folks, they're looking forward to getting in the middle of the Eastern Mediterranean and throwing him overboard. So he decides God still has things for him to do. So instead of coming straight back, he goes overland back up to Thessalonica, which is the third visit that he made. And then from there, he heads out, uh, I'm sorry, back up to Philippi, Neapolis, and takes a boat, and he sort of skips along the coast. You'll notice he does not go back to Ephesus, because he just spent almost three years there. And he knew if he went back there, they were going to not want him to leave. They were going to latch on to him and say, you got to stick around a while longer. So he didn't go. He sent word ahead, and he met in Miletus, he had the elders from uh, Ephesus come down and meet him in Miletus. So he actually visited the church in Thessalonica three times, but none of them for very long. He had a great affection for them, and then there are other times where he sent some of the men that he worked with, uh, Timothy and Silas especially, to visit them, to make sure they were okay, and then to report back to him. And again, the indication is that the first and second letters he wrote to Thessalonica, that he had written the letter, he got a report that was very positive, that they were doing well, despite the persecution and things, but they had some questions. He wrote that letter, and then the suggestion is that within a relatively short time, he's still at Corinth. Corinth is where he was when he wrote both of the, the Thessalon Thessalonian letters. Uh, some people propose that he was somewhere else, that maybe when he was in prison in Caesarea or whatever, but every indication is that he was in Corinth. He sent the first letter, and then, just a, a month or two or three later, he gets a, somebody else comes along and gives the report that they got the letter and they really appreciate it and they're still doing pretty well, but they've got some other questions. And so he writes the second letter, which addresses the issue of has the Lord already returned, which somebody had falsely taught them. Okay? So, um, but you get the feeling, especially in the first letter, of great affection. Now, the letter of 1 Thessalonians has never, never seriously been questioned as being a letter of Paul. I always have to say this because you'll run into lists that say, they'll just say, well, these letters are written by Paul, these letters weren't, even though they say they're written by Paul. And you need to have some understanding. The reasons why some people more often have scholars in the last hundred years have questioned the authorship of 2 Thessalonians, there's several reasons. One, it lacks the tone, the familiarity and the affection that 1 Thessalonians did. If you read them, if you read 1 and 2, you can't tell the difference. That doesn't mean it wasn't written by the same person. It may be that they got him on a bad day. And you know, I, there's some days I'm more affectionate to people I care about than other days too, right? And they say that there's a slight difference in vocabulary, like 10 words appear in 2 Thessalonians that aren't 1 Thessalonians. And because he raises some, some things like this man of lawlessness, which we have no record of Paul talking about that sort of thing anywhere else. But he seems to be talking about something he had taught them in person when he was there. So none of that, the interesting thing, even though 2 Thessalonians has been questioned in terms of Pauline authorship, there are more um, attributions in, amongst the early church fathers. We're talking about, when you say the early church fathers, that means the first generation of people, uh, the first or second generation uh, after the apostles. The apostolic fathers is always the people who came the next generation after the death of the apostles. And then the early church fathers will be the first or second generations, early on still. But the early attributions, uh, are, there are more early attributions of the second letter of Thessalonians to Paul than of the first one. 
even though almost nobody questions the first one. John? Will you repeat that? Who was it right after the disciples? They were the, they were the church apostles. Apostles. No, no, right after the apostles. Okay. Yes. The, the next generation were the church The next fathers. generation who had known the apostles are called the apostolic fathers. The fathers. Now, the first several, two or three generations, are called the early church fathers, okay. which, is a, which is a little broader definition. Meaning, uh, but again, some of them may have still been alive, for instance, when John was alive. But those who, the, the apostolic fathers, are the first generation after the apostles who had known the apostles. <coughs> And were considered, therefore, to be authoritative because they had they had been converted under the apostles. They had learned from the apostles, etc. And then you have the you know those who had known those who had known the apostles, kind of thing. All right. Okay. Um, let's look at the books. First Thessalonians, Apostle Paul. Again, no one seriously questions this. There's always somebody who questions everything, but nobody seriously questions that Paul is the author. Now. We've talked about this before, but there are some books that are not, that don't identify their own author, especially Old Testament books, because with the Hebrews, they didn't often do that. And so they have questions about, well, did Ezra really write Chronicles or not? Questioning that is, is an academic issue, and if they do it for, for skeptical reasons, it may be a problem, but for the most part, it's not a problem. But when the book itself says, I, Paul, wrote this, if you then doubt it, then you're basically saying that this isn't believable. And the, whole, the, the veracity, the reliability of the whole book goes out the window. So in the case of the Pauline letters, both 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Paul identi it's the, uh, the books identify themselves as being written by Paul. So when you say Paul wasn't really the author, you, you've taken part of the canon of Scripture and said, we don't believe this. And that's a much more serious thing than questioning whether Ezra wrote Chronicles or whether Jeremiah wrote, you know, um, uh, Ruth or whatever it is. Okay. Yes. Um, I wonder why, he, uh, like in Romans, and, uh, they didn't identify themselves as the writers. They did. He did. And almost all of Paul's books, he identifies himself as the author. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that's one of the things that's unusual right, about it, Paul. Is it the Hebrews? Which one is it? Hebrews is the one we don't know who the author okay, was. That's, that's okay. what I was thinking. Um, but <laughs> there are five of Paul's 13 letters that most liberal scholars in modern times don't think Paul wrote them. Well, again, that's a very, very serious accusation. It's not just an academic point. You know, you're saying that these, these mislead in terms of who the author was. Well, how can you trust anything else? Since they say... I, Paul, am writing this. So it, I think that unless there is absolutely, um, unless there's a serious enough piece of evidence to tell you to take that out of the Bible, then I don't think we have room to suggest that it's not written by who says who it says wrote it. In, in one of your classes, you, you were talking about how it was the style um, where the author would not draw attention to himself. Mm -hmm. You're the Hebrew about, style. The Hebrew style. Paul was quite different in that regard because right. being, being a Hebrew, but m most often, that's why almost none of the Old Testament books identify who the writer is. Um, it, it, the first five books, the Pentateuch, the Torah, um, traditionally attributed to Moses, it does say in several places that Moses wrote down the things God told him to write down, but it never says, I, Moses, am writing this book of Deuteronomy. It doesn't say that. And so when you read even evangelical commentaries, they will say, well, the book is anonymous. doesn't mean there's no tradition for who wrote it, but itself it doesn't say who wrote it. And so when they say anonymous, they simply mean the book doesn't claim, it doesn't tell us who the author was. Okay? Yes? Well, I'm not saying that this is the case, but it's always possible that Joe Blow might have wanted to get something across, and so he claimed he was Paul writing this book. Well, and that's, uh, that's what liberal scholars would say is, but <laughs> there's a couple points we always have to remember. One, there was not an upside to claiming to be a Christian, especially a Christian leader in the first century. In fact, there was all sorts of reasons why you would not want to be identified as that. It's not like you're going to get elected to public office of people who are a good Christian. You're more likely to get arrested and persecuted. So there was no upside for doing that. It's also true that during the, the writing of most of these things, for instance, the, the author, the, the scholars, or pseudo-scholars in some cases, who say that 2 Thessalonians was not written by Paul, 
They still believe it was written early because it doesn't have a highly developed Christology and various other theological reasons. And so they, they, they have to jump through hoops to try to explain, well, if this was, wasn't written by Paul, but it says it was written by Paul, and it was written early, and it was well enough known that it survived till today, then how did they get away with the fact that there would have been Thessalonians there right then, during that time who said, no, this isn't written by Paul. We would know if it was written by Paul, but this wasn't said to us. Um, the, the pieces don't fit together. And so a number of those things, like the fact that, that the, the, the books of the New Testament that were accepted by the early church were accepted, most of them, in a time period when either the people who wrote them or the people who knew the people that were supposed to have written them were still alive and around. And that's why there's some books that they, they said back then, no, the Gospel of Thomas is not Scripture, not only because it's got some crazy stuff in it, but that we would know who the author was. Because knowledge of the author was one of the primary criteria for accepting this stuff. That's why the book of Hebrews is such an anomaly. You know, it, the exception proves the rule. The fact that it's the only one, we don't know who wrote it, and yet the, the content is such that everyone early in the church agreed that, no, this is God's word to us, makes it an example of how rare it would have been for anything to have been accepted back then if they weren't absolutely sure they knew who wrote it. Yes, Ken. I mean, it's very simple also. Those books that were written by those supposed Joe Blows, you don't find them today. Exactly. They're, They're not, not here. here. Yeah. And, that's, and, the why, and the reason why is they weren't accepted as Scripture because they were not perfect. And, and, and we're not in accord with Scripture. Right. And again, the, but the biggest thing is people who assume someone would have written this, a book like this, and claimed that they were the Apostle Paul, there's no upside. You don't win any awards for that. You get in trouble. You know, there was no motivation for them to have done that because we think with a 21st century mindset where being a Christian is necessary if you're from a small town in the South, for instance, back then, not so much. It was, it was a real uh, negative to anybody who would make claims to, you know, to this kind of writing. So. And none of the Dead Sea Scrolls had Paul mentioned or anything. The Dead Sea Scrolls are only Old Testament. The Dead Sea Scrolls oh, came okay. before Paul. Oh, okay. The Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, yeah, are about that. <laughs> yeah, several hundred years before Jesus was the last of the of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, in terms of in, in terms of the the documents and scrolls and stuff, they were they were hidden away by the Essene community, which did exist at the time of Jesus, but all of its Old Testament because they were a Jewish sect. They were not a Christian sect. Okay, so they and and by the time the Essenes stored the Dead Sea Scrolls to hide them from the Romans. Um, it would have at the latest been about the time Paul was writing his letters, you know, the mid-first century. Okay. okay. Any other questions about that? Okay, let's talk about the books. We believe that it was written uh, A.D. 51 to 52. You will hear people say as early as 48 or 49, as late as 53, but everybody pretty much agrees it was written quite early. Um, again, I believe Galatians was the, was the first book written in the late 40s. This one was the next one after that. The theme is primarily an emphasis on the second coming of Christ. This was the problem they were having. Well, you know, what's going to happen to our friends and loved ones who, who accepted Jesus but then died? Are they just going to rot in the grave and when Jesus comes back, they're not going to be part of the deal? Uh, so the, all, both of these letters are mostly, not entirely, but mostly dealing with the second coming of Christ. The purpose to provide instruction, support, and encouragement to a young church in time of persecution. Those same Jewish instigators and those same thugs that had chased um, Paul and his friends out of Thessalonica and then went 60 miles to, to follow them to Berea and create problems there, those same people had continued to persecute the church. Again, at the instigation of some Jews who did not like the fact that Paul had planted a church and that church was, was attracting people. Um, very roughly, you could say that there's two parts to this book. A personal reflection on the relationship with the Thessalonians, or Thessalonians, and then instructions. Okay, let's look at a, a more detailed outline. First, Paul starts with thanksgiving for the Thessalonians. Um, he, he has gotten a report that they are holding out against persecution, that they've remembered him, they think fondly of him, they are maintaining the faith in light of the opposition, so he talks about why he gives thanks for them and the genuineness of his reasons, that he really does hold them seriously with affection in his heart, and he really seriously does give thanks for them every day. 
We then get into chapters 2 and 3. I'll just throw it all up there. Um, where Paul defends his own apostleship in almost every place where Paul ministered. Somebody would question, well, you know, is he really that important? Is he really the one we ought to be listening to? Because in many cases, other people came along preaching other gospels. And so the question of, do we listen to Paul or do we listen to somebody else? That affected the church in Corinth, it affected the church in Galatia, it affected the church in Colossae, and to a lesser degree, it also was an issue here in Thessalonica. He defends his apostleship by his actions. He talks about, you remember when I was with you, how I acted, and he talks about the fact that I did not expect anything from me, from you, you didn't have to support me, I was not a burden to you, I acted out of a sincere desire for your well-being, which was a fulfillment of his role as apostle. He then explains that he, he says, I would have want, I wanted to come back to you several times, but it's, uh, the devil has prevented me from it. I've been absent from you because I, I couldn't get there. I've tried, and I hope I can still come and visit you. And he does twice after writing this letter. Um, but he, he's been sending emissaries. He then prays for his visit, prays that he will be able to visit them, and he prays for the Thessalonians, that they will be blessed um, along the way. He then gives them exhortations, in other words, instructions for uh, encouragement for how they should live their lives, concerning their personal lives, and then concerning the return of Christ, which is where he gets into the fact that, you know, don't worry, those who have died before um, you, that when the Lord comes back in power, they will be the first ones to join him in the skies. The graves will open, they will be raised up into the heavens to meet with Jesus, and then those of us who are still alive will then be called up. So you, those of your loved ones who have died in Christ, they're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. And then he talks about the life in the church, how the church needs to conduct itself. He finishes with concluding prayer, greetings, and benediction. Okay? So Paul writes this letter and sends it off. A couple of the verses that are um, especially significant here, 1 Thessalonians 3, 12, and 13. Make, uh, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. This very intimate kind of sharing of his affection and love for these people. May he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. There's one of those references. This is the very end of chapter 3. At the end of every one of the chapters, he makes mention of, in one way or another, the return of the Lord. Because that is the overriding theme here. Then 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That was what they were worried about. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. That summarizes the problem, the fear that they had, and what Paul, how Paul addresses it. That passage from uh, 1, Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, um, we often use it in memorial services. And given the nature of our community, we have all too many memorial services here. Uh, but that passage, talking about what it will be like in the end, and the assurance that our burial, our death and our burial is not the end, but that we will continue with an eternal life with the Lord forever. Okay? Bob? Are these verses possible references to the book of Enoch? Why would they need to be? As the book of Enoch talks about the Lord coming back with his, with his holy ones. Right. Um, as do other references. There's no indication. I mean, it's not an exact quote from Enoch for sure. Uh, there's no... I don't see why we need to think it is. You know, there, were, there would have been other writings about um, what happens to us after we die as well. But the book of Enoch, it's unlikely it's quoted here because it was determined not to be part of Scripture, and Paul Paul would have been as critical about that as anybody. I think Paul here is, is giving witness to his own learning, what, the, what God has taught him. You'll remember that he said he was lifted up, there was a man who was lifted up into the third heaven, he writes in Corinthians, and was given training on all this stuff, was given an understanding of what's going to happen. So I think Paul is quoting his own, the thing that he was given by God. But on the other hand, Paul quoted Greek, Greek philosophy. So he didn't always quote 
Right, but in this case, he's de dealing with a spiritual topic. He didn't quote Greek philosophers on spiritual issues. He quoted them in, in arguing with, in other words, to relate to people who were um, linked to Greek philosophy, like on Mars Hill, the Areopagus, and in other places where he's talking to Greek philosophers in order basically to say, I know your stuff as well, now let me tell you what's more important than that. That's different than quoting the Greek philosophers to try to make a spiritual point. He was doing to try to connect with them and to show that he knew his stuff too. Okay, John? I was just going to say, it, it's consistent with Paul to, to see that he, um, if he quoted something, he would say, as it is written. Mm -hmm. And it would always come from the, from the Old right. Testament. So, uh, that's true. You know, that was consistent. That's, that's a consistent model for his letter. Yeah, it doesn't mean he had to do it that way. But again, there's also no reason for us to believe that he's supporting somebody else here. That. You don't see an exception to that. Uh, Becky? Um, I was wondering, if, did they make more than one copy so that like other churches could read it in church? Or did they just carry around one copy of his no. letters? We, we've talked about that, the fact that they had scribes in those days and they would have copies made. Now, specifically, in the Thessalonian letters, he sends it to... And it was, it was carried by Timothy or Silas or others going back there. And he specifically says, make sure you read this to everyone in the church. There are other places where he says, um, like the Corinthian letters, he said, share this with the other churches in the area and make sure you read the letter that I sent to the Laodiceans, which we don't have a copy of. We don't know what that letter was. So there are two things. One, they did have letters that were circular, which meant they would go from one church to the other church to the other church. We think the book of Ephesians may have been actually a circular letter that they dropped the name of Ephesus in there because as long as he spent Ephesians, you would think that the letter has, would have more, more uh, informality, more relational stuff, more of a sense of who was there because he probably knew them as well as he did any church anywhere. But it doesn't. It's all very you know, kind of formal and, and staid. And we think that that may have been a circular letter intended for, say, the seven, you know, the seven churches of Revelation. But that we got a copy of our earliest copies of it, and we have some copies that don't, but our earliest copies have the name of Ephesus dropped in because that was a copy they had. So they also had scribes. The scribes were responsible for making copies of things, that was their job. You know? And so they would have had copies made and distributed. But it was expensive and time consuming to make a copy, so they often would share them. Did they have large churches or were they just little small churches? Most of, most of them at the time of Paul were small. I mean, they would have been uh, quite small. Now, uh, eventually they grew quite large. The church at Ephesus ended up building a basilica, the Basilica of St. John. You know, a basilica is a Greek-style church, which is large. It's like a Greek version of a cathedral. Um, there were other fairly substantial churches. You can visit a lot of the ruins now. None of those churches are still standing. Most of them in modern-day Turkey um, are gone. In fact, there are very few churches of any kind there. 98% Islamic, but they would grow to large churches, but since Paul just planted these churches, they would have been mostly house churches. They would not have been in their own buildings for the most part. Um, that would have been much more rare. Yes, Seth? Um, you mentioned in one of our other classes that Paul was expecting Jesus to come at any time. Are we seeing that in verse 17 yes. there as well? Yeah, I think absolutely that he thought, you know, Paul... Um, he gives counsel to people based upon the fact he thinks the Lord is going to return right away. And so he writes here, and you can sort of read the assumption, um, when he says the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are still alive and are left. Meaning he assumed that most of them would still, you know, they had died already, either most or many of them would still be alive when the Lord came back. So he expected it to be fairly immediate. He did not expect it to wait to, the Lord to wait 2,000 years. Now, Scripture itself says the reason that God has not, Jesus has not yet returned, that he has tarried, he's delayed, is in an effort to have more people have an opportunity to hear the good news. You know, it's actually an act of mercy that he has not acted earlier. Rich? Is he writing these on scrolls of parchment paper that are long? Is that the letters? That they, they would have been on scrolls at that point because the only, the only portable, uh, they only had two portable media for writing on. One was parchment, mm -hmm. the other was vellum, which was animal skins. But usually if you're writing a letter to somebody, you know, the vellum was usually kept reserved for sacred documents or official, you know, like the, the king wanted something written down because it was very expensive. It was the skin of animals that had to be specially treated in order to be used as writing material. You didn't use that for a letter that you were writing to your friends. And we need to always remember that these were letters being written 
from one person to a group of people that he knew. They were much closer to the correspondence you would have with family members and friends than to some sort of, you know, we now see it as sacred scripture, but it was not perceived that way when Paul wrote it. Now, he knew he was writing God's own words in many ways, but not to the extent that he would spend a huge amount of money for a vellum so that it would last forever. Okay. So it would have been written on parchment. All right? Anything else about this one? Well, let's look at 2 Thessalonians. Again, Apostle Paul, and you will notice that it has um, a very similar date. We believe this probably was written only a few months later. Time enough for his first letter to have gotten there, for them to have reacted to it, and then come back with some, some additional questions and responses. Um, in it, he presents uh, a little more extensive uh, eschatology. Eschatology means the end times. The eschaton is the end of time. So eschatology is the theological word, word for the study of how it's going to be at the end of time, you know, when the Lord comes back and all of that. So purpose similar to 1 Thessalonians, to encourage the persecuted believers, to exhort them to be uh, steadfast in their work, to correct misunderstandings about the Lord's return. So he encouraged them again in the persecution. He explains the day of the Lord, when the Lord is coming back, the fact that it hasn't happened yet. And then he gives them ex exhortations toward the church. Uh, this should say 2 Thessalonians, my apologies. Um, introduction, he starts out again giving them greetings. Now, this is a little stiffer, not quite as warm as 1 Thessalonians. I'll grant the, the liberal scholars that. It's not sufficiently different than you can say that Paul didn't write it because all of the, you know, Everything else about it is consistent. And there was no upside for somebody to forge something like this, and it would have been early enough that somebody, since this survived and the church kept it, and we know that the church used it and believed it was uh, Paul's writing to the church in Thessalonica, somebody would have known that this was false if it had happened. Okay? So he gives them greeting, he gives thanksgiving for their love, uh, their faith, their love, and their perseverance, and he... Um, he says that he is offering intercession for their spiritual growth, not for their spiritual growth. I need to, need to prove this a little better. Then he goes on to specific instructions and an exhortation. Instructions, he talks to them in a prophetic way regarding the day of the Lord. And he says, whatever they're telling you, don't listen to these people that the Lord has already come back and you missed it. That's not the case. He gives thanksgiving for the Thessalonians for their election. The fact that they are secure in their position of the Lord and are calling to be part of the kingdom of God. And then he offers a prayer for their service and their testimony. In other words, the part B there, thanksgiving for their election and calling, is a thanksgiving for their position as believers in Jesus Christ in the church. And then secondly, he gives a prayer for them to then practice that in the world by serving and by giving testimony. He then exhorts them in several ways, meaning he, he gives them strong encouragement to act out their faith, to, um, he calls for them to pray, he charges them to discipline within their own body. And apparently Paul got some reports the second time that there were some people there who were either a little bit disorderly, not like the, not like the Corinthians, bad, but somewhat disorderly and also lazy. And he, he has an expression here, those who don't work should not eat, all right? <laughs> Very practical. Actually, Vladimir <laughs> Lenin lifted this line from Paul, 2 Thessalonians, in the, in the Communist Revolution in Russia. And they used the line in the Communist Revolution, those who do not work should not eat. Well, Paul is the one who says that here. And then the conclusion, final greetings and benediction, similar to the first letter. Okay. Um, key verses, there are several we could use, but I picked these two, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 3. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us. Apparently somebody had written to them and said this, this is from Paul and it misled them. Um, saying that the day of the Lord has already come and, and you missed it. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Again, this man of lawlessness reference, we believe he was referring to the Antichrist, you know, which we get details of in Revelation, etc., that Paul had been, had been, God had given him a, a, information about this. Otherwise, we don't know anything about it. And every cult you could shake a stick at has tried to make some big deal out of this. It's, it's the Pope, 
or it's the you know the president or it's somebody you know that they can can point at or it's a, a some other religious leader or what we don't know and going in those directions is really destructive um, it's, and it's it's not godly all right so don't go there don't let anybody else take you there yes John? It, it would seem to me that when that does happen it'll be recognized oh yeah you yeah. won't be speculating yeah we won't have that problem in fact revelation it's one of the interesting things the book of revelation says that there will be two witnesses to the truth and they will be murdered and their bodies will be left in the street and it says, and the whole world will witness this. And they'll lie there for several days, and then they'll come back to life. Well, for 2,000 years since John wrote the Revelation, the book of Revelation, I'm sure everybody's thought, how will the whole world be able to see that? I think I know how. It's a thing called the Internet and broadcast television. Okay? YouTube. Um... Even countries that don't have regular broadcast television now have internet access. And so we now understand that some of the things that were prophesied 2,000 years ago, there, there are very practical ways in which those things that nobody else could have even conceived of being possible. Like everyone in the world being able to witness or to see the two witnesses to the Lord dead in the streets before they come back to life. We now know how some of those things can happen. So uh, and one of the things it says is when the Lord returns, for instance, everybody will be aware of it. It will not be a mystery. Everybody will know when the Lord comes back on the whole planet. Okay. So, I think you're right, John. When the man of lawlessness appears, we're going to know about it. It's not going to be a mystery. You're not going to have to try to decide is it Democrat or Republican. Okay. That's not going to be an issue. So, don't let people suck you into craziness on things like that because we simply don't know. Okay. And again, Paul writes this because he's apparently referring to something he had spoken to them about and reminding them of. Um, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, From the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you whether by word of mouth or by letter. He's telling the Thessalonians they're part of the elect. You know, from the beginning, God chose you to be saved. All right? We won't go into the election thing now, but that same statement happens over and over and over in Scripture. Paul is saying, you guys can be confident because it's not even up to you. God chose you. You are part of God's own select people. And you need to take comfort in that and assurance in that and even joy in that. And hold, hold fast, knowing that you're one of the ones that God chose. Okay? Any questions about that? Well, I think going back to that, the last one you were talking about, when people get overly concerned about uh, how immediate is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we've seen the results of that just in, my, in our lifetime where the whole Hal Lindsey thing of the 70s where, you know, when we were in high school or Lake college, Grand then, we never believed we'd see it past the 80s, yeah. you know? And, or you could get married. Or we, a chance. Yeah. And, and so because of that, we saw a lot of good people withdraw from the public forum all across our country in every area of politics, of school, you know, serving in school, school boards, and we, we allowed, in that vacuum, of course, it was, it was taken over by more ungodly people. And so we've seen our country totally, and, and that had a, I believe that had a major effect in that taking place. Well, I, I don't doubt that that's true, at least somewhat true, except anybody who did that had not bothered to really read Scripture. Right. Because Jesus is absolutely clear on more than one occasion that you don't know. In fact, he says, if you think you know, you're wrong. Yeah. No one knows the hour or day except the Father in heaven. Jesus said, I don't even know. Only God in heaven. He will, that, you know, the, the, the end of times will come like the thief of the night. It will come upon you. You know, if, if a person knew when they were going to be robbed, then they would have, you know, stayed home and protected themselves. But this is going to be like a thief in the night because nobody is going to be able to predict when, when the day of the Lord is going to come. 
But see, but see what he's talking about is that was all based on scripture. What Hal Lindsey did back in the 70s formed a, an attitude, you know. Of, right. And not just Hal Lindsey. I mean, the late great planet right. Earth, Hal Lindsey's book, was is to this day one of the best selling books of all time. So obviously it had an influence. But you have a lot of people since then. I mean, the, the Seventh day Adventist Church, uh, which is, I think, is fine today, except that weird hang up about Saturdays. But uh, theologically, I don't have any other problem with them. But they went, their history is that they went through a couple of times where their leaders declared that the world is going to end on a certain day. And they went and sold all their stuff and went out on a mountaintop and stood there waiting for him, and he didn't come back. And then they found some excuse for it. Well, you've got the guy who, two years ago, from California, the TV preacher, said December 12th, was it, or something like that, the world is going to end. And he had disciples all over the United States, you know, holding signs and painting stuff on the car and everything else. The world is going to end on the, I think it was the 11th or 12th of December, two years ago. Didn't happen. Okay? That sort of thing continues to happen. And it is in direct contradiction to the Word of God. If you think you know, you're wrong. That's the only given about that. You think you got it nailed, you're wrong. And the same sort of thing, the man of lawlessness. If we start thinking, okay, well, that's Barack Obama, or that's Billy Graham, or that's, you know, John Paul II, or that's this, or that's that, or that's something else that's going to happen before the next election, da da da. No, it's not. The very fact that somebody thinks that and is publicizing that means it's wrong. It's not going to happen. That's the only thing we know about that and can be assured of. And all of the people who claim that their Christian faith has led them to believe that, you know, all of the events that are happening in Russia and, the, the, you know, the founding of the European Union was supposed to be the fulfillment of the revelation that the ten nations, you know, the, that are represented by the horns and all that are going to inform... Well, first it was the ten countries that got together in the, the European common market. That that was a symbol that the, the end time was here. Well, we've already passed that. It's now the European Union. It's all the, a lot more than ten countries. So what, what happened with that one, guys? You know? Don't listen to that kind of stuff. But let me take the devil's advocate on that. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to view facts... You're absolutely right. But there is a visceral palpitation in the hearts of men and women of God that join with this groaning of the earth for right. the coming of Christ. And I think I think that this 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 body of Christ, uh, that's why I said I think when this happens, you will recognize it. Yeah. There's no speculation, there's no trying to fit it into this cubby hole and that cubby hole and that cubby hole. But at the same time, there is this, this, we are attuned to this, to this one great event, uh, simply because we have become his children. Right. And I think that's, that will make it uh, quite visible. But it's yeah. not, it, it should not be, at the same time, it should not be ignored, scorned, or ridiculed, you know, the fact that you will be coming back. Well, and don't misunderstand me. I in no way am saying it's not real. I I'm, just, I'm just counterbalancing. And I absolutely this. believe that the, that the believers in Jesus Christ, there is in us a yearning for the day of the Lord, for that great day. Yeah. You know, there's a part of us that really wants that. That doesn't excuse not paying attention to what Scripture tells us and letting somebody convince us that it's going to be on Tuesday of next week. Okay, that, that's two different things. I believe it's going to happen. I believe we're all going to witness it. I believe it will be the end of time as we know it, the final consummation, the great day of the Lord. I absolutely believe that. But if somebody tells you they know when it's going to happen, run away. Because they don't. Bob? Well, there are some of us who know, but we can't tell you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for not telling us. I appreciate that. Uh, any other questions about Thessalonians? I promised you that we were going to be done early today. I don't think I have anything else, so I will see you next week. You get a whole 55 minutes extra today. All right.